Well, last week we were in Daniel chapter 2, and we discovered then what is meant by this biblical phrase, the times of the Gentiles. This morning in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to see an overview of the times that God has ordained for the nation Israel, for the Jewish people. You say, what does that have to do with me? Hold on, you'll see. I'm going to start, actually. You can see I have Matthew 24 read, uh, uh, stated first, but I'm going to start in the last three verses of Matthew 23 in your Bible. This uh, text begins with Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, and the reason is because he missed a, they missed a very strategic moment of Bible prophecy. By the way, is the temperature okay here? You, it's not too hot, not too cold. Good, good. All right. Let's read this. Verse 37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice there is coming a time when Israel, the Jewish people, are going to say of Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, they're not saying that today by any stretch. They have not recognized Jesus as the true Messiah, but they will. They will. You can count on it. Now, the next verse in this succession is Matthew 24, verse 1. This verse begins with Jesus leaving the holy temple for the last time in his life. And the reason, of course, is because in a very short while, he will be on the cross. In hours from stating verse 1, he will be on the cross dying for your sins, dying for my sins. Jesus taking our sins. I'll talk about that in a moment. Look at verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Now they're, as you can see, enamored with the glory <clears throat> of this temple. This temple covered an area of uh, 46 acres, or excuse me, 36 acres, and it took 46 years to build. It was overlaid with gold, and when the sun would hit it, uh, Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, wrote the brilliance of the sight of the temple. It was unmistakable. It was the center of the city of Jerusalem. And so they're pointing the beauty of the temple out to Jesus, and then he tells them something that drops them to the floor. He said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And so not one stone is going to be left upon another when it comes to to the temple. And of course, in 36 years after making this prediction, the Romans under General Titus overwhelmed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. I'll also talk about that in a moment. And then in verse 3, this is a little later on, and it's obvious the disciples at this point are confused and struggling with what Jesus said about the temple. 
And that's because the temple was not only one of the wonders of the world in that time, the temple was the center of Israel's national life. It, it was the core center of Judaism, the religion that they had embraced. And yet Jesus is saying the temple is coming down. Now watch what happens here in verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So this would be just a little later on. The disciples are really taken back. So they come to him privately saying, tell us. And he's, they're going to ask three questions here. Tell us, when will these things happen? Number one. What will be the sign of your coming? Number two. And of the end of the age? Question number three. Now, in response to these three questions, Jesus gives what is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. It's covered also in Luke chapter 21. It's covered in uh, Mark chapter 13 also. And in this Olivet Discourse, he will answer these three questions, but he will answer them in reverse order. For example, question number three, as you can see, the last line of verse three, is there a sign to look for that would indicate the end of the age, the end of the world as we know it? And the answer is yes. Look at verse 14. Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, notice the therefore is in the context of the end of the age. And so this is an event that's coming even in terms of our future. Therefore, when you see, see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place or the temple, let the reader understand. Now, I'll come back to this statement here in verse 15 in just a moment. But this verse is the answer to question number three. This is the sign of the end of the age. Now, question number two, back to verse three. Question number two what will be the sign of your coming? And the answer to this is dropping down to verse 30, Matthew 24, 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, this, as we all know, is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And of course, the second coming is one of the core doctrines of the church. Uh, Orthodox Christianity, historical Christianity, has always believed and built truth on the idea that Jesus Christ is coming again. Revelation 1.7 says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. By the way, why is it that they will mourn over his coming? Because they're not ready. They have, they have not believed. They have turned their back on the offer of eternal salvation. Now, back to verse 3 and these three questions. This is the first question. Remember what I told you. He answers these in reverse order. And so this is the first question. Tell us, when will these things 
Uh, keep in mind with this question, it's based on what he said about the temple. The temple is coming down. It's going to be destroyed. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. That's the question. When is that going to happen? Well, it's interesting to me that Matthew, in his gospel, he doesn't elaborate on this question, but Luke does. Luke does in his gospel, and remember what I said a moment ago, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark chapter 13, they are what we call synoptic gospels. That is, they are synonymous in the sense they follow the same general outline. And so look at this in Luke 21. Jesus answers the question, what will be the sign of the temple coming down? And here it is. But when you see, this is visual, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. And of course, the center of Jerusalem was the temple. And then in verse 23, he says, for there will be great distress upon the land, the land, meaning Palestine, Israel, and wrath to this people, meaning the Jewish people, and they, the Jewish people, will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. Now, as I pointed out a few moments ago, this happened in the year 70 A.D. It's well documented. You can Google it. You'll find all kinds of documentation for what I'm addressing. It's there. It's easy to understand and easy to read. It happened just 36, between 36 and 37 years after Jesus made this prediction. It took place in 70 A.D., a man by the name of General Titus, he led the Iron Legion of Rome against Israel. There was a revolt in Israel, and uh, he brought his armies against Israel and Judah and Jerusalem. And because they were uh, so resistant to being overcome by the Romans, the soldiers really went uh, way too far. They destroyed everything, all the architecture the temple was taken down stone by stone. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, documents this very well. Now, back to chapter 24, verse 15. In verse 15, as I mentioned a moment ago, Jesus is talking about the sign of the end of the age. And here's what he says again. Therefore, when you see... The abomination of desolation, maybe that's a new term for you. The abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. This is so important, notice that they kind of write at the bottom of the page, let the reader understand. This was written by Daniel 500 plus years earlier, and he's saying, let the reader understand. Now, this abomination of desolation that will stand in the holy place, that means the temple. Now, it's kind of interesting. First, he says the temple is coming down, and it did come down in 70 AD. But then he says in the future, there's going to be a temple... And in the temple, there will take place what is called the abomination of desolation. Is that a contradiction? No. There were three temples. First, the one destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, 586 B.C. The second one by the Romans in 70 A.D. And there is, in the future, a temple that is going to be built, a third temple. And in that temple we will see, or what he's talking about will take place in that third temple. Now, what is it? 
What is the abomination of desolation? Well, Paul the Apostle talks about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at this. Paul says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. It here is referring to uh, the tribulation period, the, the season of God's wrath. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. We're talking, obviously, about the Antichrist personage who, look at this, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple displaying himself as being God. Now, this very clearly is referring to, the, to, to a man who will one day be at the center of world leadership. We refer to him as the Antichrist. And in verse 4, what he's describing here, this is the abomination of desolation. It's when this individual is in the temple, the third temple, which is to come, and he, notice, takes his seat in the temple, displaying himself as God. This is so important in Scripture, it's referred to, as you can see, as the tipping point of human history. By the way, it's also interesting in verse 9 of 2 Thessalonians, this uh, man, the Antichrist, this explains where he gets his power to influence and deceive because the whole world will follow after him. Paul says, look at this, this man will come to do the work of Satan. So this guy is Satan's man from head to toe. He will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those who are on, the, who are on their way to destruction. Maybe you remember this. In Matthew 4, Jesus went out into the desert and he was tempted by the devil. One of the temptations was this. The devil, it says, took him up to a high place and was able to flash before him all the kingdoms of this world. Remember? He said, fall down, worship me, and you can have, you can have these kingdoms. You can, by the way, they must be in the devil's control or he would not be able to tempt him, right? Right? Yeah, this is not yet uh, our world. This is the devil's world, the world system that we're living in. And so Jesus, based on Scripture, remember, he rejected that. But the man that we're addressing here, the Antichrist person, he's going to accept what Jesus rejected. And he will lead the world all away from God in the last time. And of course, this happens in that last seven-year period of history. So that understood, I hope you're with me up to this point. Once again, in verse 15, I want you to see that what Jesus is saying here, this is, this is a main sign of the end of the age. When this Person, this individual, this antichrist, stands in the holy place, the temple, declaring himself to be God. This is the sign of signs. It's the ultimate in blasphemy, and it's the tipping point of history. Now, the reason I'm giving you this perspective and taking time to do so is because approximately 500 years before Jesus was ever born, Daniel, the prophet, also wrote about this abomination of desolation 
which is to come, and an event to occur in the last days of human history as we, as we know it. So if you're following me in your Bible, we need to turn to Daniel 9. I'll give you a moment to do that. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9. Now, in this chapter, in verse 1 and 2, Daniel is reading out of a uh, reading a prophecy out of the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 10 through 12. This prophecy speaks of the Jews who are disciplined by God to be in Babylon for a period covering 70 years. And then at the end of that 70-year period, God will allow them to return to their homeland. Look at this, Jeremiah 29, 10. This is what Daniel was reading. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. He's addressing that to Israel. I've got plans for you. Then, he says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Notice verse 12 is God's promise. So in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, taking this promise very, very seriously, he prays, starting in verse 3 all the way through 19. You can read his prayer. He's confessing his sin, the sin of his people. He's admitting we deserved everything that we received in terms of discipline. He's all, he also seems to be asking God, is there a role that you want me to play? I sense that the time is about to come, and I need to know, Lord, is there a role that you want me to fulfill? Now, as Daniel prays in verse 20, he gets an angelic interruption. How would you like to have an angel show up when you're on your knees? I I, I think I would like that, I think. (laughs) I think all of us would be taken back, and Daniel was as well. But I want you to see what follows. Look at this. This is verse 20. Daniel says, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, the holy mountain of God is idiom for the nation Israel. Verse 21, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, actually the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, in other words, when you started to pray, I began, God began to respond. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. That's what the angel said to Daniel, give heed to the message. He's saying that to us too, to you and me. Give heed to this message and you will gain understanding of the vision. Now, in the very next verse, verse 24, this is where God's message and prophecy begins to unfold. And so stay with me now, because in verse 24 through 27, this is God's plan for the nation of Israel. Last week, I gave you Daniel 2, and God's overview plan for the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles. 
And so this morning he's talking about Israel. Now put on your thinking cap. This is going to look very confusing, but, but it isn't. We'll get this. We'll get this. Look at verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Sounds a little confusing, but let's break it down, all right? Seventy weeks. The Hebrew word for 70 literally means weeks of years. So uh, how many days in a week? Seven. Seventy weeks of years. Tally that out. Seventy times seven, 490. Remember your tables? All the teachers in here, remember your tables? You're teaching those kids? 70 times 7 is 490. So, look at this now. 490 years have been decreed for your people, Daniel's people, who were Jews, right? And your holy city, which is, needless to say, a reference to Jerusalem. So, 490 years are decreed for your people, Israel, and your holy city, Jerusalem. All right. Now, look at it this way. Seventy weeks have been decreed. 490 weeks have been decreed for Israel and Jerusalem. And then he gives us six things that are going to happen within that time frame of 490 years. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin to make atonement for iniquity. Those happened in the first coming of Christ, but the next three are awaiting the second coming of Christ to bring in everlasting righteousness. That hasn't happened, obviously. To seal up vision and prophecy. No, it's not complete. To anoint the most holy place. Uh, verse uh, Of these six things, the first three refer to the first coming of Christ. The other three refer to the second coming of Christ. And so here's the thinking. Within the time frame of 490 years, there are six things that are going to be accomplished. And there they are. There they are. Now, the next verse, verse 25 It moves from the general to the specific, from the general to the particular. Look at this. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. In other words, Messiah the Prince referring to the first coming of Jesus. So you are to know and discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks or 49 49 years, seven times seven, 49, and 62 weeks added up, that's 434 years, And then he says, it, 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 meaning Jerusalem will be built again with plaza and moat. That simply means they will have streets and they will have a water supply system, even in times of distress. Now, follow this because we're about to understand it clearly, I think. The starting point of this prophecy Or you could say the tripwire, the first domino to fall in this prophecy is the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So when that decree is given, we're to start counting this period of 490 years. Now, when was the decree given? Well, we know 
without any doubt. We know from history, we know from Scripture, it's a well-documented date. It's found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. The date for this is March 14, 445 B.C. And so from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, comes, in other words, the first coming of Jesus, he says there will be first seven weeks or 49 years. Now, if you know biblical history, you'll know this fits exactly within the time frame of Jerusalem being rebuilt after having been crushed by the Babylonians. Babylon took them over. They were in captivity for 70 years. They were allowed to return to their homeland. Once they were there, they began to work on rebuilding their city, and it took them 49 years. That's what the text is saying. They rebuilt the city. And notice also, it says during this time, it will be built with plaza and moat. Again, that's talking about a street system along with water supply. And he says the last line, it will be built in times of distress. Now, if you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, when they were rebuilding the walls, there was so much conflict. The Bible says they did their work with a sword in one hand and a trial in the other. It was during this time of distress. Now, stay with me here, okay? He also talks about 62 weeks of years until the Messiah, the Prince. So, If you start putting this together, all right, let me do it for you. Seven weeks of years comes first, the 49 years. And in that time frame, Jerusalem was rebuilt with plaza and moat. 62 years, weeks of years comes next. That's 434 years. That totals out to be 483 years using, I might add, a 360-day calendar. Uh, They didn't use a 365-day calendar. We do. Uh, You can find this documented in other places of Scripture. They used a 360-day calendar. Now, that totals out to be 483 years or... 173,880 days. So, listen to this now. If you calculate from March 14, 445 B.C., if you start then and begin to add days and weeks, tick, 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 adding 483 years or 173,880 days, it will bring you to the year April 6, A.D. 30. The math, by the way, was done by this British scholar, Sir Robert Anderson. Uh, He wrote a book called The Coming Prince in 1918, where he did all of the the behind-the-scenes addition, and he added all of these days up, and he did the math, in other words. And here's the thing. Get this. This is the very day that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. We're talking about Palm Sunday, right? Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, They're saying, hooray, hooray, hosanna, hosanna. He knows in in just a couple of days they will all turn against him. He knows that. Look at this now. Luke chapter 19. 
In Luke, this is 500 years later when the event of Palm Sunday actually takes place for the first time. He is coming into Jerusalem. Look at this. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, The things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies, i.e. Rome, 70 AD, will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. 1,100,000 were killed when Rome invaded Jerusalem. And they will not leave in you, just like Jesus said, one stone upon another. Why? Why is this happening? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. That line, the time of your visitation, means the time of the Daniel 9 prediction. The Jews missed it. It was right there for the taking, but they, they missed it. I like this commentary by whoever. I'm not sure who wrote it, so I don't know who to give the credit to, but, but it's a good commentary. Daniel had booked an appointment for Israel to meet its Messiah. Sadly, it was a meeting that the Jews missed, and the Lord held them responsible for not recognizing the time of their visitation. It's interesting to me, they were not only held responsible for what they knew, but they were also held responsible for what they could have known but didn't. That's stunning. They were held responsible for what they could have known but didn't know. Now, give me about three more minutes, and I'll be done. But look at verse 25 again. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. The the decree came March 14, 445 B.C. There will be seven weeks, 49 years, and 62 weeks, 434, adding up to 483 years. It, meaning Jerusalem, will be built again with plaza and moat, with streets and water supply, even in times of distress. And then verse 26, he says, Then after the 62 weeks, meaning the 433 years, After that happens, the Messiah comes, but the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. You know what that means? It means, essentially, that Jesus is going to be rejected and killed, and no one will be there for him. They will even, when he's on the cross, they will even take his clothes off of him and give them to his executioners. He has nothing. And then even when he dies, he is buried in the tomb, a borrowed tomb of a rich man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. So he has nothing, nothing. He's cut off without nothing. It's interesting to me, when Daniel wrote this book, these prophecies, there was no Grecian empire. It wasn't even in the minds of people yet. There was no Roman empire. It wasn't even in the minds of people. There was no idea of crucifixion. That was a purely Roman means of capital execution. But Daniel, under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, nails it. 
the Messiah is cut off. Why? For you, for you, for me. When Jesus is on the cross, spread, he is there in my place. He is there as Bill Bailey. He is there as Sherry Bailey. He is there as Ella, as Carmen, as Bill. He is there as you. And he takes all of our sin upon him. All of it. Past, present, future. And the Father from heaven is forced to turn from his Son as he takes the sin of man on to him. That's why Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's saying those words, and you've heard me say this before. He's saying those words so that you won't have to, so that I won't have to. I don't have to ever know what it means to be forsaken of God because I have believed in Jesus and received him into my life. I've accepted the forgiveness that he offers. So what about you? What about you? He died for you. That's why the cross is held up in the Bible as the ultimate expression of love. God the Father gave his Son. Who among you as a father on Father's Day would give a child for someone who wanted nothing to do with you? Who would do that? That's why D.L. Moody said, the ultimate hell of hell will be the realization that to get there, I had to walk right over the love of God. My challenge to you today is to realize the glory of the cross and what it means to all of us personally. May we trust in Christ alone as our Savior. I'm not even halfway, so we'll get it. We'll get it the next time. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing Bible, this amazing book. We see your fingerprints everywhere. We know, Lord, it has to be inspired. It has to be directed by the Spirit. It has to be inerrant, infallible. We take it as that. We thank you that you love us enough not only to speak for us and to speak to us so that we know who you are and what your plan is, but we thank you that you love us enough to die for us, to substitute yourself in our place, to bear our sin. We thank you for what you have done in our lives And I pray there are people here today who would take that step and trust in Christ fully as their Savior and begin this incredible life of walking with God. Help them to make that decision today and help us, help us, Lord, to lean hard upon you so that you can fulfill the plan that you have for our individual lives. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me.